I am a perpetual traveler through the Bible. Please join me for the next part of my journey through the scriptures. Stay as long as you like and let us together discover a bit more about the Bible. In the previous episode, we learned a bit about the background of the letter to the Hebrews and discovered its author, when it was written, who it was written to, and the central message of the letter, which was the object of faith. In episode two, we will learn how the letter to the Hebrews is structured and who the first 10 chapters is all about. We will be encountering prophets and angels, Moses and the promised land, Aaron and the priesthood, and the mysterious character called Melchizedek. This is David Wiles, your fellow traveler in Christ, and this is the Journey Through the Scriptures podcast. Hebrews has 13 chapters. The first 10 chapters have a very simple structure and premise. Jesus Christ is compared to other leaders, systems and religious values. For the Jews to whom this letter was first written, this would be important. Throughout this letter, Jesus Christ is compared to four challenges. The prophets and the angels, Moses and the promised land, priests and Melchizedek, and sacrifices and the covenant. And every challenge to Jesus is met, answered and defeated. The first challenges appear in Hebrews 1 verses 1 to 2. In many and various ways God spoke of old to our fathers by the prophets, but in these last days he has spoken to us in his Son, whom he appointed the heir of all things, through whom he also created the world. The first challenges are the prophets of the Old Testament. These are prophets like Isaiah, Jeremiah, Ezekiel, Daniel, Hosea, Habakkuk. These prophets were very important to the Hebrews. They were great poets, orators, and authors, and their insights and views of reality far outstripped contemporary philosophers like Socrates, Plato, and Aristotle. These were great men, and God had spoken to them and through them in the past, but with a quick dismissal, the writers of Hebrews declares that these great prophets have no equality with Christ. These prophets are just spokesmen and instruments, and the author is saying that Jesus is superior to all of the previous ways that God has revealed himself through the prophets. The next challenges are the angels. In the Greek-centered world of the New Testament, angels were regarded as very important beings. Most of the Greek gods and goddesses were angels in the eyes of Greeks. They were regarded as a kind of demigod. But to the Hebrews, angels were very important as well. In Deuteronomy 33 verses 2, we read that the Lord came from Mount Sinai. He rose like the sun over Edom and shone on his people from Mount Paran. Ten thousand angels were with him, a flaming fire at his right hand. The Hebrew tradition believes that the Torah, that is the first five books of the Bible, and the word of God were delivered to Moses at Mount Sinai by angels. From Hebrews 1 verses 4 through to Hebrews 2 verses 18, the writer deals with the question of who is greater, the angels or the Son. He points out immediately that the Son, our Lord Jesus, is superior to any angel. Hebrews 1 verses 5 says, For to which of the angels said he at any time, You are my Son, this day I have begotten you, and again I will be to him a father and he shall be to me a son. This is a rhetorical question. The audience of the letter to the Hebrews already knew the answer. God never said this to any angel. The son is superior to the angels, and furthermore, the angels worshipped him. Read Hebrews 1 verses 6. And again, when he brings the firstborn into the world, he says, Let all God's angels worship him. Therefore, The angels themselves admit that Jesus is superior, and they obey him. So how could you ever compare an angel to the Son of God? There is also something more here. The word begotten. It is very important. I think the Christian author C.S. Lewis states it very well in one of his books. He says, What we make with our hands is different from us, but what we beget with our bodies is always the dearest thing in the world to us, because it is part of us. 
The angels were made, but the Son was begotten. What we beget has the same nature we have, and what we make is always different. The angels who were made cannot have the same relationship as the Son, who was begotten. In chapters 2 and 3, the author of the Hebrews points out that Jesus is the true man. He was the second Adam. He came to fulfill the destiny of human beings, the destiny that Adam lost in Eden. What was this destiny? It was the right of mankind to be rulers and kings in the universe. We see this in Psalm 8 verses 3 to 6, which is a messianic psalm, by the way, which hints at Jesus, the promised Messiah. When I consider your heavens, the work of your fingers, the moon and the stars which you have ordained, what is man that you take thought of him, and the son of man that you care for him? Yet you have made him a little lower than God, and you crowned him with glory and majesty. You make him rule over the works of your hands. You have put all things under his feet. That was God's destiny for man. But in our fallen state, we will find it impossible to fulfill. However, Jesus is there, and the writer says that although we will not yet see man fulfilling his destiny, we see Jesus sitting at the right hand of God the true man, man as God intended man to be. Jesus is certainly higher than the angels because God made man ultimately to be higher than the angels. God said of man in Genesis 1 verses 26, Let us make man in our image, after our likeness, and let them have dominion over the fish of the sea, and over the birds of the air, and over the cattle, and over all the earth, and over every creeping thing that creeps upon the earth. He did not say that about any angel, but of man. In the midst of this argument about the angels, the writer of Hebrews gives a warning. There are actually five warnings through the book of Hebrews, and this is the first one in Hebrews 2 verses 1 to 3. Therefore we must pay close attention to what we have heard, lest we drift away from it. For if the message declared by angels was valid, and every transgression or disobedience received a just retribution, how shall we escape if we neglect such a great salvation? It was declared at first by God, and it was attested to us by those who heard him. The warning is clear. If Israel was called to pay attention to the Torah that was delivered by angels, how much more should we pay attention to the message that was announced by the Son of God? Consider this. Jesus' status was high above the angels, yet he gave up that high status to become human, to suffer and to die. In the person of Jesus, we see God's greatest glory as well as God's greatest humility. His glory comes through the bringing of the Gospels. God's good news to mankind and his humility comes by his death on the cross as a willing sacrifice. So, if Jesus is higher than the prophets, and higher than the angels, then we ought to listen to him. If the prophets have influenced our history as much as they have, and the angels are the powerful invisible agents of God working through all of history, then surely we ought to listen to the Son. We must not neglect to listen. This is the first warning. In Hebrews chapters 3 to 4, the next challenges are brought into the arena. Moses and Joshua, or the promised land. The stories of both these great men of God are found in the Old Testament. The Hebrew people idolized them as the supreme examples of men mightily used of God. In chapter 3 of Hebrews, Jesus is compared to Moses, and in chapter 4 he is compared to Joshua. As a quick aside, the name Jesus is a Greek name, not a Jewish name. It is the Greek version of Yehoshua or Joshua in Hebrew. It means God is salvation. Hebrews 3 verses 1 to 6 says, Therefore, holy brethren, who share in a heavenly call, consider Jesus the apostle and the high priest of our confession. He was faithful to him who appointed him, just as Moses also was faithful in God's house. Yet Jesus has been counted worthy of as much more glory than Moses, as the builder of the house has more honor 
than the house. For every house is built by someone, but the builder of all things is God. Now Moses was faithful in all God's house as a servant, to testify to the things that were to be spoken later. But Christ was faithful over God's house as a son, and we are his house if we hold fast our confidence and pride in our hope. The word house actually means the house of God, and it appears six times in this passage. There is a very common and bad habit amongst Christians that refer to a church building as the house of God. A building has never really been called the house of God, either in the New Testament or the Old Testament. In fact, when the early church referred to the house of God, they always meant the people. A church is not a building. It is the people. Church buildings only started appearing in the 3rd century. Even the temple or the tabernacle of old was not really God's house. Look at what Isaiah 66 verses 1 to 2 says. Heaven is my throne, and the earth is my footstool. What is the house which you would build for me, and what is the place of my rest? All these things my hand has made, and so all these things are mine, says the Lord. When the Apostle Paul was preaching to the Athenians in Acts 17 verses 24, he reminded them that God dwells not in temples made with hands. When Paul said these words, the temple was still standing in Jerusalem. No, God does not dwell in buildings. Then what is the house of God that is mentioned here in Hebrews? The answer is right here in verse 6. We are his house. God never intended to dwell in any building. He dwells in people, in men and women. That was God's intention all along in making man, that they may be the tabernacle of his indwelling. And what is the argument that the writer of Hebrews is bringing? It is very simple. Moses was a servant in the house of God, but Jesus is the son to whom the house belongs and for whom it is built. So he obviously has superiority the house of God here being man. Moses was only a servant in the symbol of the house of God. Jesus is the son in the very house itself. Moses and later Joshua led Israel towards the promised land, a symbol of the rest of God, but Jesus leads believers into the actual place of rest. In chapter 4 verse 10 it says, for whoever enters God's rest also ceases from his labors as God did from his. Let us pause there for a moment. If you stop depending on yourself and your own efforts, then you have learned to enter into rest, because you have started depending upon another. That is God's work in you. This is the long lost secret of humanity. This is the secret that Adam and Eve lost in the Garden of Eden, and that Jesus Christ came to restore for us. When we learn to operate like that, we learn to be perfectly peaceful, calm, undisturbed by circumstances, trusting and effective, accomplishing things for Christ's sake. That is rest. But we mustn't miss the second warning that is laid out in the last part of chapter 3 and is expanded in the first part of chapter 4, the author retells the story of how the Israelites rebelled against Moses in the wilderness, and they lost their chance to enter into the rest that God prepared for them in the promised land. Here in Hebrews 4 verse 7 is the second warning. He again fixes a definite day, today, saying long afterwards through David, as already quoted, Today, if you hear his voice, do not harden your hearts. If Jesus is greater than Moses or Joshua, how much higher are the stakes if we rebel against him and resist his leading? We are all in a wilderness-like environment in this world, where we have to trust God for the future rest in God's new creation. So let us make sure that we do not rebel like Israel did in the wilderness and lose out on God's gracious offer to enter his new creation. Let us therefore make every effort to enter that rest so that no one will perish by following their example of disobedience. Let us strive to enter that rest, 
just like Hebrews 4.11 says, or like those people in the wilderness, we fall away and lose out what God has for us. The next challenger to the superiority of Christ is Aaron, the high priest of Israel, and along with him the whole system of priesthood. A great part of this letter has to do with the subject of priesthood, and it is very important because priests have a great value in the Jewish tradition. What do you think priests are for? In the Old Testament, priests had two very important functions. They had to relieve guilt, and they had to remove confusion. Hebrews 5 verses 1 explains this. For every high priest chosen from among men is appointed to act on behalf of men in relations to God, to offer gifts and sacrifices for sins. This is the relief from guilt, to lift the load and the burden of sin. And Jesus can deal gently with those who are confused. Hebrews 5 verses 2 says, He, that is Jesus, is able to deal gently with those who are ignorant and are going astray, since he himself is subject to weakness. When someone is confused, they are often ignorant and miss the path, and do not know where to turn. Today's equivalent of a priest, perhaps, is a psychiatrist. Priests did what psychiatrists do today. They tried to relieve the load of guilt and to straighten out people's confused and ignorant approaches to life, and so they were very important. The writer of Hebrews goes on to show that Jesus Christ has a higher priesthood, symbolized by the man Melchizedek. Melchizedek appears in the Old Testament in a really mysterious way. He appears once and deals with Abraham and then is never heard from again. He is referred to twice in the Old Testament, in Genesis 14 and in Psalm 110, but he remains a figure of mystery until you come to the New Testament. In Hebrews, we are helped to see what the strange man symbolizes. He is the picture of the priesthood of Jesus Christ. This story is recorded in Genesis 14 and tells of Abraham meeting the king of Sodom after he had defeated four other kings in battle. Although Abraham did not know it, he was in trouble. To quote a rather well-known movie line, the king of Sodom was about to make Abraham an offer that he could not refuse. An offer of the plunder from the defeat of the four kings that would potentially undermine Abraham in his walk of faith. Melchizedek suddenly appears and rescues Abraham from the trap of wealth and riches. So Melchizedek was instantly available, just like Jesus, to strengthen in the face of temptation. Furthermore, it says Melchizedek was a king without father or without mother. This is as far as the record goes in the Old Testament. He was a picture of Christ in his eternal relationship. He was instantly available and he was permanently available. His service to Abraham at this time was to strengthen him, picturing the way Jesus Christ actually strengthens us. Melchizedek strengthened Abraham by the offering of bread and wine, which in the communion service are the symbols of the body and the blood, the life of the Lord Jesus. There are many theologians and Christians that believe that because Melchizedek was described as a king without father or mother in Hebrews 7 verses 3, that he was in fact a pre-incarnate appearance of Christ in the flesh. This is called a Christophany, but of course that is not really the author's point. The author of Hebrews is more interested in showing off Jesus' superior priesthood to the Jewish Christian converts. That is why Melchizedek appears in this letter, to present the picture of Jesus Christ as a high priest who is instantly available to us. This is why the glory of the priesthood of Christ is so vastly superior to anyone else. Your psychiatrist may go on holiday, he might die, but Jesus Christ never dies, and he is never off duty. He is instantly and permanently available and he actually strengthens you with the impartation of his own life, symbolized by his body and his blood, the bread and the wine, in Genesis 4, verses 18. This is David Wiles, your fellow traveler in Christ, and this has been the Journey Through the Scriptures podcast. 
episode 2.